This reading is from censor number 126. And before I begin, I'd like to read a few thing, little quotes from the masthead. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And that's 1 Thessalonians 5.21. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. Proverbs 22, verse 16. He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, 20. And as the nail sticks to the stick, to the stone. So sin sticks to buying and selling. Ecclesiastes 27, verse 2. The article is called A Question of Freedom by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D. Since the time men and women left the land and settled in cities, especially during the Industrial Revolution, this move was thought of as a gaining of freedom. Young people wanted to leave the farm and find their fortune in the big city. Once in the city, one needed a job to support himself. Many times it was a matter of any job. This attitude proved a boon to business, which found it profitable to exploit the situation. Workers experienced low wages and terrible working conditions. As workers tried to improve their lot by forming unions, they were fired, beat up, or killed. At this time, the police and National Guard were on the side of the employers. Workers had no rights. In our capitalistic system, there is a built-in uneasy tension between employer and employee. The fatal flaw in the system is that the boss will never pay an employee what he's truly worth. The employee is always forced to make more for the employer than the employer pays him. The worker is always exploited, and this is accepted as natural, as if it were God-ordained. As a thought experiment, ask yourself why is it so readily accepted that an individual drags himself out of bed in the morning, hits the streets, newspapers, internet, unemployment office to find a job, wouldn't it be more logical and economical for the business or corporation to seek out the worker? Our thinking, politics, economic decisions are all done from the point of view of the boss, the business, the corporation. It has now become clear to all who truly observe that not er, observe, excuse me, and not just see that Democrats and Republicans owe their allegiance to corporations and big business. Over and over again, censored has informed its readers that when corporations own the government, are married to the government, that is fascism. Where is your freedom in such a situation? The only freedom we have today is the freedom to shop. Today we have people and politicians calling for and enacting cuts in food stamps, WIC, and other programs that help the needy and the poor. This is all done under the guise of cutting the budget to make government smaller and save it money. This is a lie. These people are not serious. If these people were serious, they would be going after waste and fraud, subsidies and grants 
as well as tax breaks to huge corporations and the rich. Censored 125 showed clearly that these tactics are merely attacks on the poor. These cutters of programs for the needy and poor hate the poor and are jealous of the poor. They believe the poor get something for nothing. These in entitlement cutting politicians have managed to get the poor to fight among themselves for crumbs and bitch that the other guy got more than him. While politicians laugh all the way to the bank. Politicians have for years conspired with certain government agencies to save money by denying people benefits that they are entitled to. Recently, a doctor, working on behalf of the Office of Black Lung, was exposed as denying people had black lung disease when they did have the disease. Claimants also get tied up in court for years and years until they die, which saves the government of money. Even the Social Security Administration has been exposed as having an official policy of denying first-time disability claims, knowing that about one-third of claimants will not pursue their claim. Even cost-of-living adjustments to COLAs are rigged. The CPI calculation used is all a scam. All of this is a conscious decision by our government to increase income inequality. During the Georgia W. Bush administration, the United States began giving tax money to faith-based organizations. The First Amendment to the Constitution grants freedom of religion, but not the supporting of it. There's supposed to be a wall of separation between government and religion. We already unfairly grant religions tax-exempt status. According to the Bible, all religions are not equal. And all those professing to be Christians are not Christians. Mark 7, verses 7 through 9. Wherever one looks concerning government, the payouts flow upward. The average American is screwed at every turn. Our government engages in welfare. Our government is for sale. During the financial meltdown of 2008, markets failed. Banks could not borrow. Nobody would lend. No one could refinance. But foreclosures mushroomed. Millions were out of work. Two auto manufacturers filed for bankruptcy protection. Banks failed. And the stock market crashed. Behind all of this were deliberate mistakes and machinations accomplished by men like Phil Graham Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, Arthur Levitt, and Alan Greenspan. All these opposed the regulating of derivatives and credit default swaps. They got President Bill Clinton to go along with them, and he signed into law the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which allowed all hell to break loose. The problems grew and grew. And yet these smart men knew it all. But their premise was wrong. All they did was as a result of the get way of life, the devil's way of life. Ben Bernanke, another perceived smart man, said in October 2007, the United States banking system was healthy. In fact, 
the banks were starving for capital. All this as a result of greed. How's that freedom thing going for you? Private industry is the basis of the capitalist system, and therein lies the problem. It cannot be distressed too often that expecting the private sector to provide jobs for all who want one is wrong. It's a big mistake. It amounts to nothing more than a sop to industry. Keep this in mind, all who think government cannot work and is too big. The taxpayer rescued the entire financial system in the United States, 2008. All would have been lost if not for big government. Eight million jobs were lost in the chaos of the financial meltdown. The new finance was a failure. Did you have any say in any of this? Feeling free yet? Some ideas, even when proven wrong and dangerous, are hard to kill. It has become clear by now that market liberalism has failed, and our ideas about economics are wrong. Market liberalism reared its ugly head in the 1970s, and since the 1980s, companies have abandoned any pretense of a social contract with their workers. Economic growth in the 1960s before market liberalism took hold was 4.3% a year. While after market liberalism became the flavor of the day, growth in the 1990s was only 3%. We have had jobless recoveries in the 1990, 91, and the 2001 recessions. At this time, there are 3 to 20 applicants for every available job. The growth of the financial sector has been staggering. Its share of corporate profits in the United States in the early 1980s was only 10%. 10 and in 2007, it was 40%. This financial monster soon began buying political power. It was a debt machine. It bought deregulation, which gave it more freedom to manipulate money and exchange rates. All checks and balances were removed. And by the end of President Bill Clinton's term, speculation ruled the day and debt followed. Behind it all, was the short-sighted, arrogant, we-don't-need-government mantra. This is paradoxical reasoning. The financial markets created the financial meltdown. They were uncontrolled. And of course, this led to disaster. In all of this, we note that political power has shifted overwhelmingly to the wealthy. Inequality began to rise again in the United States during the 1980s. It is claimed by some that tax revenues doubled during President Ronald Reagan's administration. It was conveniently forgotten that revenues rise naturally with inflation, population growth, and with increases in real wages. In 2008, the poverty rate was 13.2%, and real incomes of the poor have gone down in the last 30 years. In 2008, food insecure households amounted to 49.1%, excuse me, 49.1 million Americans, and 15% were without health insurance. In 2007, there were 1.6 million homeless Americans. What many of us are stumbling upon is that equal opportunity 
is a myth. Knowing all of this, and more, parentheses, see censored number 125, end of parentheses, what has led evil men and women in Congress to cut food stamps, WIC, and other needed social programs. Adam Smith warned us to beware of capitalists because their interests are not, are never exactly the same as the public. Their interest is generally to deceive and even oppress the public. In 1882, William H. Vanderbilt, in true capitalist style, bellowed, The public be damned! The capitalist, although most times cloaking himself in some form of phony Christianity, believes the poor are unfit to survive. They are nature's failed experiments. Jay Gould expressed his disdain for workers when he said, I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. Today's capitalists have gotten workers and the poor to fight among themselves for crumbs, while the big boys and girls cart off the whole loaf. A type of socialism reared its ugly head in America at the end of the 19th century when big business began running the economy. In 1886, corporations were illegally regarded as persons as per the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Things got so bad that the Sherman antitrust laws were enacted to de- which were enacted to defang big business and regulate them in regard to the public interest, these laws ended up being used against unions. Unions were portrayed as conspiracies in restraint of trade. President Grover Cleveland understood what was happening when he said, that corporations were becoming the people's masters. President Teddy Roosevelt also saw the handwriting on the wall when he said that regular folks can't get a square deal with the rich controlling everything. Roosevelt called the rich malefactors of great wealth. These men understood that we need public power to counterbalance private power. Those who call for smaller government in this sense are selling you out, are making you of no effect. Their objective is to have no firewalls between us and the viruses of the big corporations and the wealthy. In 1913, the income tax was instituted to also defang the wealthy and big corporations while redistributing income throughout the economy more fairly. In 1914, Henry Ford began giving his employees $5 for eight hours of work. At the same time, steel workers were getting $1 for 12 hours work. Henry Ford was in business to sell cars, and he knew that if his workers did not make decent wages, They would not be able to afford buying his cars. Consumer credit came on the scene in 1920, which expanded the economy. Today, many people believe that the stock market represents the economy. But the Dow Jones is merely the average stock price of 30 huge companies. The consumer is the economy. Workers are the economy. Milton Friedman maintained that people were motivated by self-interest and that concentrated power, that means government, is a threat to freedom. There was not one word from Friedman about unregulated, concentrated corporate and wealth power. 
This brand of laissez-faire economics claims that the government, that is, you and me, should never intervene in the economy. This ideology has brought suffering and hardship to our economy, but it has concentrated the wealth upward to those who already have. Our government has been taken over by the very interests it was supposed to regulate. Some die-hard Republican conservatives regard President Ronald Reagan as akin to a god. According to these sycophants, Reagan saved America from liberal ruin and brought the Soviet Union to its knees. Let's examine some of what Reagan actually did. In 1981, the tax rate was lowered to 50%, and in 1986, it was lowered to 28%. Some loopholes were closed, and some others were added. Huge corporations got tax cuts and rebates. In 1981, General Electric, a firm Reagan worked for, got $150 million. The government and deficit ballooned under Reagan. So much money was thrown at the Pentagon that it paid inflated prices for things such as $643 for a hammer and $2,043 for a nut. Reagan's tax breaks went almost exclusively to the rich. There were 130 Reagan administration officials investigated, indicted, or convicted, which was a new record. In 1982, 1983, and 1986, Reagan raised taxes. The base was broadened, and Social Security taxes were raised. So most people, except the rich, paid more taxes. The, dash, the national debt was below one trillion dollars when Reagan took office and was over one trillion when he left. The rich got richer in the 1980s. Until the 1980s, the United States was the world's biggest creditor, but soon it was the world's biggest debtor. We got massive homelessness under Reagan. We got rising health care costs, joblessness, loss of family farms, and gated communities. Reagan was no saint, nor a god, and could have been impeached for Iran-Contra, selling weapons to Iran, which was illegal. Government policies during the 1980s were deliberately crafted to concentrate wealth in a few hands, those who were already wealthy. The plan was to starve the beast, the government, so there would be no money for people-helping projects, a reverse Robin Hood. And so we come full circle. We poked holes in our vaunted individualism, our worshipped upward mobility, and our supposed equal opportunity, our freedom. We have discovered that our freedom is an illusion, and that the only freedom we really have is the freedom to shop. The end.